Christmas is over, feeling overloaded, <laughs> overbloated perhaps. <laughs> There's lots of ways we can be overloaded. <laughs> I feel for the tyres on this truck, <laughs> these trucks. New South Wales police would have a field day with these guys. Why make 14 trips when one will do? <laughs> New South Wales railways have uh, got a way to go before we catch up to Indian. You can overload your donkey, or your truck, or your mini bike, or your hair follicles. And uh, lots of us know about being snowed under with all sorts of just stuff that happens. Well, the interesting thing is that when you come into this passage, it's all about the laws that were heaped onto the people of Israel. Our passage, this is just selected verses, opens up with, when the time came for the purification rites, look, required by the law. This is not an optional extra. They had to do this partway through. They did the sacrifice that was in keeping with the law. And the passage rounds out by saying they had done everything required by the law. They were just loaded up with lots and lots of laws. There were hundreds of laws that they had to keep. In particular, th this is the, uh, the law that they were zeroing in on for the uh, presentation of Jesus at the temple from, from the law, Leviticus. The Lord said to Moses, A woman who gives birth to a son is to bring to the priest these two things. First, a year old lamb for a burnt offering and a young pigeon or dove for a sin offering. That was the standard law. They had to bring that, a, a lamb and a double pigeon. There's a, an escape clause, if you like. Uh, there's a but. But if you can't afford a lamb, lambs weren't all that expensive because they were so plentiful and that, they were constantly being sacrificed. There was a, a regular stream. It's not a big deal. But even if she can't afford a lamb, then she's to bring two doves or two young pigeons rather than a, a lamb and one of the birds. So that was the law that was required. So when they come, required by the law, written in the law, in keeping with everything that was said in the law, and it's interesting that what they do to confirm the law is a pair of doves or two young pigeons. So Mary and Joseph arrive in the cheap seats. And there's no lamb involved in this. They can't afford even a lamb as cheap as they and plentiful as they were. Let's do a little timeline. I love timelines. I, I, <laughs> it's my hobby. I, just rope me in if I go too far. The birth of Jesus took place. The shepherds heard about the same night. The angel said, Today there is born to you a Saviour, Christ the Lord. So the shepherds arrive within hours of the birth of Jesus. So Steve and Jenny, be warned. Shepherds might arrive uh, later today. Yeah. Just, yeah, welcome them. No, they're, they're nice folks. On the eighth day, a male was circumcised. You don't need to do that anymore. It's an, it's an optional extra. And then 40 days, that's what we're reading today, at 40 days they presented Jesus at the temple and they brought the poverty offering, not the standard offering. The standard was a lamb and a dove, a lamb and a pigeon. But they bring just the two birds because they've got, they're as poor as church mice. Really interesting stuff. Aren't you excited by that? I know I am. And then they, they return back to Nazareth. The thing that's interesting is, where's the money? Show me the money. The wise men have turned up and they have brought with them gold and frankincense and myrrh. Just jumping ahead 30-something years... Jumping ahead. Oh, look. You, you've read the story, haven't you? You know what's coming. Remember, Judas complained because 
the woman arrived with this little jar of spikenard and put on and he said this could have been sold for a year's wages so even this little bit now frankincense and myrrh fall into that same category so when the wise men arrive with gold and these very expensive marketable products they would have had more than enough money for a lamb they could have bought a flock of sheep but it hasn't happened and then they go back to Nazareth with and these wise men who are supposed to be part of the Christmas story haven't even arrived the wise men turn up at Jerusalem after they'd heard King Herod the Great they went on their way and the star which they'd lost sight of they had uh, they saw it when it rose in the east went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was not telling us where that place was on coming to not the shed not the barn not the manger but coming to a house they saw the child with Mary's mother and Joseph's conspicuous by his absence at this point they bowed down and worshipped him and they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense and myrrh what happens next? well we turn to Lorraine who says ah that was the money that was needed to fund the escape to Egypt where they then live for goodness knows how many months if not more on the proceeds that the wise men had brought with them are you excited now? Probably not as excited as I am, but yes, that's really interesting, isn't it? Uh, so they returned to Galilee, uh, to their own town of Nazareth. Now, it was a pretty slow trip down, as Steve explained, for pregnant mothers. Uh, uh, the trip back, it's the same length, but if they could make 15 kilometres a day with you know, uh, ladies, you know, you give them birth, you've got a five-month, a five-week-old baby, you're feeling like trekking over hill and dale, camping out for several weeks. Mm. You know, not enthused by that, obviously. Yeah. So it's a journey that would have taken at least a fortnight and probably a whole lot more. Uh, that's the journey from uh, Bethlehem, where they was born, up to Jerusalem, where the presentation at the temple, and they just kept on going. It was on the way home. There's lots of laws, lots of rules, particularly in the Old Testament, but the New Testament has got them as well. Do you ever say, thank you, Jesus, for all of these rules that I have to keep? Why not? Not very good Christians, are you? <laughs> I'll hear your confession later, my child. <laughs> God has given us lots of rules we're going to focus on rules uh, today here's one of them a New Testament rule let us consider how to spur one another on to love and good deeds let us not neglect meeting together as some have made a habit but let us encourage one another and all the more as you see the day approaching now you can feel pretty good about this because here you are at church what is the rule the rule is, come to church. A uh, big tick for you. You're, you're ahead of, head of the game at the moment. The rule is go to church. Now, what do you do with that rule? If you focus on the rule is I must go to church, then it becomes a drag because it's just this is the rule. I've got to do this. Oh, you know, why would I bother? There are so many reasons why just thinking about this is the rule slows me down you can think smarter than that and I and clearly you are uh, because if you can get to the point where hang on why is this a rule why did God say turn up to church well it's because there's a reason behind the rule and the reason is he loves you and he wants to nurture you and care for you and ensure that you get the best and you can grow and, and mature and be supported and encouraged by other people and you get to practice doing those things on these forgiving people who will 
think, oh, well, it's just Ian. And, yeah, he gets it wrong all the time, but <laughs> we love him anyway. Well, God loves him anyway. <laughs> and, and so the rule, the law, doesn't become such a trial because you're thinking bigger than just the rule. That there is a reason that leads to rules. Forget about, well, no, don't forget about, don't, don't focus on the rule, but focus on, hang on, there's a reason why the rule is there, and then get beyond that. Because if you obey the rules, then you end up getting better results as to what God wants to achieve out of you. Back in the 1800s, some fancy um, famous fellow said, there are so many who observe Christ's birth, but there are so few who observe his precepts. Plenty of people celebrate Christmas. Thanks for the prezies. Uh, yeah, this is a great, good to have a day off. Yeah, but what happens on Boxing Day? Where's the celebration of Jesus then? The people who turned up on Christmas Day. What happens on the Sunday after Christmas? Where are they then? Now, you don't, have, you don't have to go to church to be a Christian. But if you don't, you end up being a pretty shabby Christian. You miss out on so much. You're not going to go the full way. There are lots of laws, lots of rules. Here's a, a, an example of a rule. You know, the rules of grammar. Let's eat, Grandpa. Let's eat grandpa. <laughs> the, the words are exactly the same. But it's just the inclusion, or perhaps it's the exclusion, of the comma that completely changes the meaning. The rules are helpful in giving a better outcome, particularly for grandpa. <laughs> There are rules for the road. Imagine if everyone decided that I can ride, drive on whatever side of the road takes my fancy at the moment at whatever speed I like and yeah, road rage, that's okay. Nothing is a problem. See, there are rules but there's a reason for the rules and they give better results and in particular it works even for doing good relationships. Relationships have rules. The first word that any child learns is the word no. <laughs> Learning it from the very beginning, there are rules. You know, don't dig Tony in the ribs saying he still needs to learn the rule. <laughs> so is Tony. <laughs> There are rules for relationships. But, the, but to let Tony off the hook a little, if you can incorporate the rules with the reason, it's not just about the rule anymore. I think, I, I do this, but I know why I'm doing it and it makes a difference to help me understand, oh, this is actually a good thing to do. It's a good thing to obey the rule and then you can ramp it up to get even better. If you get beyond just, I'll do the rule and I know there's a good reason for it, but you can go further and say, this becomes now not a rule that I obey, this is one of the values that I take into my life. I value not just obeying the rule, but I integrate it into my life. This is important. It is important for me to speak well, use the right grammar, not just to protect grandparents, but to communicate well and effectively so that people understand what I'm talking about. It's important. I value people who drive on the right side of the road. I lost count of the number of morons, uh, uh, unskilled uh, drivers that I've seen even this morning getting here. So it works a bit like this. Here's an example. This is love. Love is 
walking in obedience to his commands. Now, love is the value, but you link it in with the rule. You can do the rule. You can walk in obedience. Okay, I'm going to turn up to church. I'm going to hate it, but I'll be there. Or you can say, God loves me and I want to celebrate his love and I want to reciprocate his love and I want to enjoy all that that is. And it makes a whole difference to be obedient to him. So there are reasons why they improve results and it builds relationships, particularly if that love becomes the value that you, you make your very driving force rather than the rules. Now, let me be just a little bit facetious. This is all stereotype, but you'll get the drift. Boy-girl relationships. Any, any relationship always starts out with rules, but here's just a, a shallow example. He has got rules and she has got rules. They're different rules, but they each have rules. His rule is she must be pretty. Unbeknownst to him, her rule is he must be smart. He's got a rule that says she must have a good body. Her rule is he must have a good job. His rule is she must be responsive to me. Her rule is he must be responsible. Some of you are laughing, but you know it's all true. Okay, it's stereotyped, I know, but you can see just how legitimate that is. Relationships always start with rules, but they can't stop there. If you're in for the long haul, rules will get you started, but they won't take you that far down the track. You need to get beyond just having the rules to developing values that you both share. Now, boy, girl, husband, wife, workplace team, just you know, partners in business. You've got to get beyond the rules to say, what is it that is important for us? What do we value so that we can then go the distance? Get this, rules are something that are imposed from outside. I do them because someone says I have to. Whereas values are the rules that I impose on myself by my own choice because I recognise that this is so important. It's just beyond the rules. And shared values, they're things like, you know, in a couple like this, for example, if you're going to go the long haul, you need to have shared values on finances. If he's off buying red sports cars, if she's got 3,000 shoes, then there's going to be some tension in the home. Oh, sorry, I didn't realise that was so close to the bone. <laughs> No, oh, I'm trying not to look at anybody while I say <laughs> You've got to share values on, on finances, on what your career is going to be, on the friends that you choose, on parenting. But especially the core is the spiritual values that you lock in. If you don't share spiritual values beyond just the rules of turn up to church, then it's going to end in tears. It's going to be so difficult. You've got to lock in. This is what's valuable to me. And it would be a great conversation starter to ask, what were the rules that brought us together in the first place? And then what are the values that keep us going when we've forgotten about what those rules once were? Let me go back into... Uh, the Old Testament major prophet Isaiah thus says the Lord your Redeemer the Holy One of Israel and we'll, we'll unpack that first of all behind the rules is the one who writes the rules who is he? he is the Lord he's the one who makes the rules he's the one who sets it up he's in charge of the entire universe the rules are his to make 
They're not open for discussion. They're just the rules because he is Lord. The good news is that when we break the rules, as invariably we will because we're sinners, then he's also Redeemer. He's going to rescue us from ourselves and from our failure and take us into a better place. And what is that place? He is the Holy One. The place where the rules are taking us is into holiness to be able to relate to him at the highest level. And then he goes on, I'm the Lord your God who teaches you, teaches you what the rules are and what are they? They are what is best for you. He doesn't impose rules because he wants to make life difficult, but because he wants the best for you and direct you in the way that you should go. Oh, I should do it, but I don't always get there. And so the heart of God cries out, if only, if only you had heeded my commands. He didn't go to Moses and give, here are ten suggestions. They were the ten commandments. And there's lots of them. If only you'd heeded my commandments, then what would you get by obedience to God's commands? You'd get peace. You'd get well-being. And they would be like a river that keeps on flowing, like the waves that keep on crashing onto the beach. It never, 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 never ends but it, if to get there we need to start here with his commands to heed those there are rules for everything you can't get away from rules God's not being particularly obnoxious by giving us rules there's rules for, there's rules for sport there's rules for driving there's rules for relationship there's rules for grammar there's our beloved politicians are making rules for us all the time. That's why we pay them, to make more and more rules for us to obey. We must love them. Psalm 19. Many of you have memorised Psalm 19 because it's just so beautiful. Uh, <clears throat> the first paragraph is about seeing God in, in nature, in the universe, and how fabulous that is. And then it narrows down from seeing God out there to focusing on the law of the Lord is perfect, the statutes of the Lord, the precepts of the Lord, the commands of the Lord, the decrees of the Lord. You can't get away from it. He wants to give you lots of rules because he knows how good they are for you. That's what love does. And what are these rules? They're perfect trustworthy, right, radiant, firm. You can lock these in. You can build your life on what God has said because he wants the very best for you and shows you the way that you should go. God's rules are so good. Why aren't we saying thank you, Jesus, for all of these rules? They make life so good. And what do they do? They refresh the soul. They make simpleton wise. They give joy to the heart, light to the eyes. And all of them are righteous. Thank you, Jesus, for all of these rules. They are such a blessing. They refresh my heart. They strengthen my relationships. They are more precious than gold, sweeter than honey. And your servant is warned. In keeping them, there is great reward. In keeping his commands, there is great reward. So here we are, New Year's Eve. We're on the very brink of a, a new year. Instead of a New Year's resolution, I promise to eat less chocolate. Oh, yeah, as if that's going to last until Monday, right? <laughs> what about something that is enduring? that is refreshing to the soul, that will cleanse and renew and support and give you a, a solidarity for how life is going to unfold. Back in the same Isaiah passage, he is the Lord, your Redeemer, the Holy One. So 
let's jump into this new year celebrating all that God is, that he is Lord, he is the one who makes the rules and it's not for me to debate with him whether they're good or bad, right or wrong, whether I should you know, feel like doing them. It's just the rules, he's Lord, but he's also my Redeemer, the one who takes me into his heart so that I can be holy with him. He's the Lord, your God. So we need to obey all that God wants us to enjoy through these rules. He is the Lord who makes the rules, but he's your God. You're the one who is to buy into this. And we need to enjoy all that God gives. To heed his commands means his commands, my peace. His commands, my well-being. Thank you, Jesus, for all the rules. How good it is. And when someone thinks that, well, you're such a loser for following all God's rules, it's not about me. It's I value who God is and what he says and I can see that it is the best way to live. So, want to have a happy new year? Thank you, Jesus, for all the rules. You just saved me a lot of hassle. I'll just do what you want me to do. Let me pray for us. Father, thank you. Thank you for the rules, the rules that make it clear the rules that set the right direction, the best direction, the direction for our well-being. Oh, we can have peace and joy just by committing ourselves to do what you say. Lord, open our eyes, the eyes to see in Scripture what you're saying. Open the eyes of our heart to understand what it is that you want to say to us through your word and open our courage to step out and do what you call us to do, to live in obedience to you so that we can indeed be blessed through this new year and on through eternity. For we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.